Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, this is He Tian. I'm a system professor from the Department of Material Science Engineering. Uh, together with me today is my uh, colleagues, uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Andrew Wang and uh, Dr. Wang Lei uh, from uh, uh, Chemical Engineering and Material Science. Uh, we want to firstly welcome everyone to the, to the webinar today. Uh, today, we're very honored uh, to host Professor Peter Strasser uh, from the Technical University of Berlin to give this online research seminar. Uh, Prof. Stresser is one of the leaders in the field of electric catalysis. Uh, I'm sure today's talk will be highly interesting to many researchers in the US and as well as Singapore, because so many of us are working in this field. Uh, this seminar is part of the Materials for the Future uh, seminar series from the Department of Material Science and Engineering, as well as the Chaos webinar series uh, from the Center of Advanced uh, 2D Materials. I also want to thank the organizers such as Bernice and Marilyn for their hard work. Uh, so let me just uh, give you a, a brief intro of uh, Prof. Prof. Strasser. Uh, Prof. Peter Strasser obtained his PhD in physical chemistry and electrochemistry uh, from the Fritz Harbor Institute and the Free University in Berlin uh, under the direction of the Nobel laureate uh, Prof. Uh, Gihard Ertel in 2000. Uh, after that, he joined the Silicon Valley company in the US or working on high throughput catalyst uh, discoveries. And as we just found out, he actually uh, came to Singapore uh, to uh, had a, had a chance to come to Singapore at the time. Uh, in 2004, he joined the University of, uh, University of Houston as assistant professor, and then later in 2008, he took the position from the Department of Chemistry as a Technical University of Berlin as a chair professor uh, of electrical chemistry and electric catalysis, uh, the position that he still uh, holds today. Prof. Strasser has published more than 350 scientific papers and has 15 U.S. European uh, patents. Uh, he has been a highly cited researcher since 2018, uh, has, been, uh, has given more than 200 invited talks uh, throughout the world and received numer numerous awards, including uh, Christian uh, Chopin Golden Medal from the European Fuel Cell Forum, uh, the Faraday Medal from the Royal Society of Chemistry, uh, Brian Conway Prize from the International Society of Electrochemistry, just to name a few of uh, recent ones. A more detailed bio can be found in the seminar brochure that has been sent to uh, all the audience. And the lecture will be roughly about 40 minutes and audience can type in your questions and, uh, and later we can turn on your mic uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, even if you run out of time, don't worry, the question will be collected uh, and then uh, will be answered later. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Prof. Peter Strasser to give the lecture. Yeah, thank you very much, Hey, for this introduction. Uh, good morning uh, from Berlin. Good afternoon to Singapore. Um, I will be talking today about electrified solid liquid interfaces, a very important uh, topic where many of you and many of us um, are working. And I'm very honored uh, to be part of uh, your monthly um, seminar schedule. So our journey this morning um, starts with this gentleman here uh, on the bottom right. Um, his name is Wilhelm Ostwald, and uh, we Germans consider him as our father of physical chemistry. Um, he is actually also the father of catalysis. He also received the Nobel Prize uh, for, for, uh, in chemistry for his catalytic and catalysis work. And um, before he, he received that prize quite, uh, uh, quite some time ago in 1894, he gave a very famous speech to chemists and electrochemists in Germany uh, and where he actually uh, stated uh, this quotation, the way to solve the biggest of all technical problems, the procurement of affordable energy must be found through electrochemistry. So Oswald was a real big fan of electrochemistry and electrocatalysis. And he was already then convinced that it is one of the major key solutions to the energy problem. Now, um, while Oswald actually had the coal fuel cell in mind at the time, uh, so he realized that the principle of a fuel cell, the electrochemical conversion of energy is more efficient than the thermal one. Uh, his statement actually has received uh, a totally new meaning uh, today in our modern times because of a concept that we refer to as power to X. And power to X 
is a concept that has a bright side and a dark side. So power to X, the bright side of power to X essentially is the capture of sunlight, of radiation and its conversion into free electrons, which is typically an intermittent um, process. Uh, and the dark side of power to X, and this is where the title or the subtitle of my talk today uh, comes from, the dark side of power to X involves as a key component electrochemical conversions. For example, here shown with the blue um, circle uh, in an electrolyzer or in any sort of electrochemical um, device. And at the heart of these electrochemical or electrocatalytic devices are solid liquid interfaces as uh, schematically shown on the top right here. And understanding and studying such electrified solid liquid interfaces is key to design those electrolyzers, and that is key to uh, the entire dark side of solar fuels and solar chemicals. And as many of us um, uh, know, in these electrolyzers, we try to convert uh, molecules, uh, energetically low-lying molecules, perhaps molecules that by some are considered waste molecules or harmful molecules into something useful. And that can be a useful gas that would be then power to gas. It can be something that can be used in chemical industry that's power to chemicals or something liquid, a fuel, for example, uh, power to the liquids. It also includes, of course, the back conversion of fuels into electricity. And then we're back to the fuel cells and the original idea of Wilhelm Ostwald from the 19th century. To give you just a quick example of how power to X can look like in modern times, I'll show you the plan of a cement plant, which is being built and planned here outside Berlin in Germany. So on this map, you can see different colors and the different colors are units with different functions. And here the orange function is indeed the cement function. So the cement plant will still sell cement but this is only one product in a portfolio of products. You can see that the cement plant will also have a renewable um, energy uh, generation, electricity generation. It will have water electrolyzers, uh, at, but also something uh, which is shown here, the CO2 to CO electrolyzers. And these will be important uh, components in order to, to uh, make liquid fuels uh, that can be sold uh, separately uh, by the cement plant. Of course, they can also uh, sell the captured CO2 um, separately. So this is a kind of a real life example of today, how power to X can be realized in real world. And today my talk will actually be focused here on this topic, the CO2 to CO um, electrolysis. And this reaction of converting electrochemically CO2 in something useful is quite complex, as you know. Um, you see here the CO2 molecule, and you see some major products of that uh, reaction process. And when you look at the number of electrons which are being used in these processes, these are very, very large. And that makes these processes kinetically very um, difficult, very sluggish. And the way you can solve such sluggish catalytic problems um, is that you typically, you can decouple uh, uh, the, the, ele the coupled elementary steps and you can separate them uh, in time and in space. This uh, spatial sort of separation of elementary reaction um, is something that leads us to the concept of a tandem uh, electrode. And a few years back, uh, our group together with Jan Rosmeisel's group, we were describing the concept of a tandem cathode, for example, uh, for the case of an efficient fuel cell. In uh, the cathode of a fuel cell, as you know, is the reduction of molecular oxygen uh, to water. That's a four electron process. And that is kinetically very demanding. And you can uh, increase the efficiency by splitting the four electron process into two, two electron processes. So when you look at the fuel cell, you can split the cathode into um, regions, a region one, 
uh, that takes care of the first two electron transfer and a region two that takes care of the second two electron transfer. And then if you separate the two reactions spatially, you can actually operate each electrode uh, in its optimal uh, uh, electrode potential and perhaps closer to its individual normal potential. And that is the advantage of designing and running a tandem electrode. So we would like to apply that same concept also for the CO2 uh, electrolysis process and a uh, suitable molecule basically to split the entire reaction sequence is the CO molecule. So um, the CO2 molecule can be converted into first CO and then the CO molecule can be led into a second electrolyzer cell, which then takes care of the conversion of um, CO into more complex products, ethylene or liquid oxy oxygenates or something. So the, the concept on the left, I call the tandem cell design, where you have two electrolyzer cells working in tandem. Whereas on the right side, you see another form of a tandem concept, that's the tandem electrocatalyst design. That means that you employ one, uh, you have one electrolyzer cell, but you have a material uh, which you design with two different functions such that these two uh, consecutive steps are being coupled uh, on the molecular scale rather than on a macroscopic scale. I will not have time to discuss the right side, but we want to take a look at a few selected aspects of the tandem electrolyzer cell design uh, right now. The first question that comes to mind is what are suitable catalysts for the first of the two tandem cells and for the second of the tandem cells? The first one is to convert CO2 to CO. So we need to look at the elemental, uh, the periodic table for suitable catalysts. Now, in a past uh, collaboration, again with Jan Rosmeiser, we found that you can understand the selectivity of elements. Uh, very nicely when you look at their uh, interaction with CO and with hydrogen. And you see this here um, in this plot where you see the binding energy of CO versus the binding energy with atomic hydrogen. Um, what you see is that mm, mm, surfaces or catalysts that bind CO and hydrogen very strongly are mostly making hydrogen, so they're no good catalysts. And on the opposite, you can see material surfaces that don't bind hydrogen uh, very strongly, in fact, very weakly, those are the ones where you expect either CO or formic acid. It turns out that the hydrogen binding energy sets the selectivity that you can expect and achieve in this process versus the CO binding energy to some extent determines the products that you can expect. Except for CO and formic acid, yeah, what distinguishes the CO from the formic acid selectivity? There, it's actually the presence of atomic hydrogen. In other words, formic acid in the presence of atomic hydrogen on the surface always decomposes in CO. And that's why only for those surfaces which have very weakly binding, uh, very weakly uh, bonding to hydrogen, those are the ones where you can expect um, formic acid. And the candidates then from the metals at least would be like silver or gold for our first electrolyzer of our tandem cell. However, then in 2015, we reported that solid so-called single metal side MNC catalysts um, are also very efficient catalysts for CO2 to CO and hydrocarbons. Uh, we reported this in 2015 and we used an iron catalyst. Now, I'm sure you're very familiar with these kind of catalysts because they have been discussed for a long time as cathode catalysts, PGM-free cathode catalysts for fuel cells. And the molecular analogs of them have been used for CO2 reduction also for at least 30 years. Um, but here, these materials are solids, solid catalysts uh, made in pyrolysis uh, uh, processes, which also feature these single metal sites. And they turned out to be also very good for CO2 reduction. So then Jan Rosmeisel and his group actually um, picked up the idea of these single site catalysts and he expanded that set of catalysts that are available uh, for the CO2 reduction process. And here you can see in blue, these are the metals that you seen before. And now using the single site catalyst and varying the metal, you can see additional candidates in these various four quadrants, meaning having different selectivities. Uh, 
And the interesting thing is that you have additional candidates like a manganese NC, iron NC, and cobalt NC that fall in the binding range of copper or comparable to copper. And as you know, that is the metal, the only metal uh, that we know that can make so-called beyond CO products like methane, ethylene, or oxygenates. You also see additional candidates up here in the CO uh, section, like nickel NC, co copper NC, and palladium NC. So uh, the advantage, uh, just to make this clear again, the advantage of the single site catalyst is that now you have, you force certain adsorbate on top, which on the metal surface could actually sit uh, bridged or uh, threefold hollow. To show you this, look at the surface of a 111 metal, uh, uh, single, uh, single crystal surface, and you can see that the hydrogen atom has a choice between the on top position, a bridge position, and a threefold hollow position. And when you look at the binding, the free energy, uh, binding energy of starting from CO2 and then placing a hydrogen and a, a carboxyl uh, intermediate on top, you can see that the hydrogen binding is preferred, it's lower, uh, because it has this threefold hollow option. And that makes such a metallic catalyst less selective for CO2 reduction. On a single site catalyst, however, you are forcing the hydrogen and the CO2 intermediates onto an on top binding. And that actually makes the hydrogen bonding less favorable. You can see here, the bonding of the CO2 intermediate and the hydrogen are comparable. And that raises the uh, resulting fer Faradayic um, efficiency uh, on this catalyst. So uh, we were, since 2015, synthesizing various candidates. We started with iron uh, and then we proposed nickel and we're still on nickel in a, in a new project that has recently started. And we're comparing uh, nickel-based single site catalysts derived from a variety of precursors uh, you all know them, the model, uh, the metal <clears throat> uh, frameworks, uh, the uh, covalently uh, frameworks, covalently bonded frameworks, uh, polymers, um, the zinc emitted solium frameworks. And as reference, we always look also at the molecular catalysts, uh, so, so to speak, to have the molecular analogs. And uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar what these then look like on the molecular scale with stem eels. You can actually image the uh, direct site uh, directly. You see the signal from the nickel atom and from the coordinating nitrogen atoms, which are coordinating uh, the metal ion and holding it in place, so to speak. And here on the right, you can also see the individual uh, nickel atoms imaged in the high resolution uh, microscopy um, image. And when you put them first in a kind of a screening cell with a liquid electrolyte, you can see a little sketch of our H cell um, here. You're not achieving very high current densities, but this is more of a screening to see what of the catalyst actually is doing anything uh, catalytically and you compare them, you can, you can see between iron, nickel, copper, manganese, and cobalt, it's iron and nickel that sort of have an eminate, an eminent uh, Faraday efficiency that looks interesting. And you clearly can see that iron reaches the maximum efficiency earlier, earlier meaning at lower overpotential uh, versus nickel reaches higher Faraday efficiencies, but it requires more overpotential in order to do so. And you can see here the Faraday currents. Uh, these are early measurements from a few years ago. And then you can select and uh, basically determine the maximum efficiencies in these liquid electrolyte experiments. And you can understand this reactivity using DFT as uh, shown again here. You can see how the nickel NC does not like hydrogen, meaning um, it shows an enhanced selectivity for the CO2 reduction process. And in the CO and CO2 binding scheme on the bottom right, you can see that on iron, CO is actually binding relatively strongly. So, uh, and we were experimentally able to show that the iron uh, is basically has a certain CO coverage and we can strip the CO uh, with cyclic voltammetry. 
And that has an, an added benefit in case that you're interested in more than just CO. Iron, at least, is for us uh, the element that has also shown uh, beyond CO products like hydrocarbons. And an example uh, of when that happens is given here in an um, operando X-ray absorption spectroscopy experiments of an FENC catalyst at various overpotentials. At some point, you can see that the absorption edge is actually moving to lower absorption or edge energies, uh, lower photon energies, which indicates a change in the redox state of the metal ion into something which we consider uh, like an iron one plus state. And this change from an iron two plus to an iron one plus state, uh, interestingly, seems to correlate with a significant onset in uh, the formation of hydrocarbons, uh, in this case, methane. Well, I must admit that the hydrocarbon uh, formation efficiency is limited and small compared to that of copper, but it's still interesting that these non-metallic catalysts are able to produce hydrocarbons um, at all. So now let's look how these nickel, in this case, nickel NC catalysts perform in uh, real uh, sort of CO2 to CO electrolyzers. Uh, this shows a picture, a photo actually of our electrolyzer. Uh, we go in with uh, water on one side and we come out with oxygen on the anode. And here we go in with a humid, humidified CO2 and we come out with uh, ideally CO sometimes mixtures of CO and CO2, and also hydrogen, depending on the Faradayic efficiency of the cell. And we're doing this, by the way, uh, in the context of a European project called Select CO2 uh, that we do uh, in collaboration with Brian Sega and Karen Chan from the DTU, uh, EPFL, Sophia Hausner, uh, TU Delft, and the Dinora Corporation. As you know, Denora is an Italian company uh, that actually um, manufactures uh, uh, GDEs and GDLs uh, for electrolysis processes. And here you can see a performance curve, uh, the Faraday efficiency of CO in a flow cell. And we have as reference a, uh, in green, a Denora silver uh, gas diffusion electrode. Um, this is a commercial gas diffusion electrode which is used in the oxygen depolarization uh, process for the chloralkaline uh, uh, process. I'm sure you know that instead of making hydrogen in a modern chlor plant or chlorine plant, you're reducing oxygen and for that you're using these um, silver GDEs. And what you see in blue and red are two candidates from our project. Uh, these are nickel NZ catalysts derived from metal organic frameworks. And you can see that we stay at 100% um, CO, uh, currently roughly up to 300 milliamps per square centimeter. And meanwhile, we have actually very recently achieved also 100% up to 400. And these are current densities that actually become industrially relevant. And that is why the Siemens Energy Corporation uh, is now uh, commercializing, is, is really manufacturing and developing two square meter uh, electrolyzer cells for CO2 to CO uh, production. And uh, they are in an advanced development stage. And this will probably be the electrochemical CO2 uh, process, which is first commercialized. Now, you may say, okay, if you can operate the cell now at 300 milliamps per square centimeter, because you have 100% uh, selectivity for CO, you come out with 100% carbon monoxide. Uh, the, re the reality is that's not the case. Uh, the reason is the following. It has to do with a parameter, with a design parameter uh, that needs to be in a way is chosen when you operate electrolyzer cells. And that parameter is called the stoichiometric ratio lambda. Everyone or every one of you who works in the fuel cell area knows what the lambda uh, does and how important it is. Lambda is defined, and I have it here, lambda is defined as the ratio between the inflow, the molar or volumetric inflow of CO2 divided by the uh, 
flow or the consumption rate of CO inside the electrolyzer cell. So if you have no consumption, then lambda is basically infinity. And, it, and you, if you have complete conversion of the CO2 uh, to CO, then you basically have a lambda of one. And now the question is, while this is uh, uh, desirable to have a complete CO2 utilization, is it actually physically possible? And in order to check that, uh, I, I, uh, I made this plot here, or my students made this plot where you plot lambda versus the applied um, current of such a CO2 to CO electrolyzer cell. And you have two types of lines. Let's first look at these lines that go down, more hyperbolic. Uh, and what you see here is these are lines that predict the lambda value as a function of the current uh, using Faraday's law, essentially. And you have to make a couple of assumptions. The fact is when you look at the reactions up here, CO2 turns into CO, uh, but you're making two molecules of OH minus. These two molecules of OH minus, however, are the ones that supposedly cross the membrane to the anode. But in reality, in a CO2 electrolyzer, these OH minus react with additional CO2 to form, for example, carbonate, like shown here that such that when you, when you add those two equations together, for every CO molecule that you make, you're actually consuming two molecules of CO2. And now the alternative is that these two OH minus molecules um, uh, react with only, uh, not with one, but with two CO2 molecules to bicarbonate. And then you would have a ratio of actually three CO2 going uh, to one CO. Yeah? And in parallel, when you look at the hydrogen evolution process, uh, for every molecule of hydrogen that you make, you again generate two molecules of OH minus. They again consume a molecule of CO2 uh, and they form carbonate. And then carbonate is the species that crosses the membrane. So you can say for every molecule of hydrogen that you make, you're also consuming one molecule of CO2. And you have to put, or you have to take these into consideration when you calculate lambda, and then you have, you have to distinguish different limiting cases. Uh, and here in green, for example, is the case if the CO2 uh, goes over as carbonate across the membrane, and if you have 100% CO, then your lambda is actually following the green line from infinity at zero current all the way to one. And when we now plot the experimental value of our electrolyzers, of our experiment, then you can see this is the dashed black line. And you can see that this dashed black line is following very closely to the theoretically predicted lambda under the assumption that it's carbonate that is crossing the membrane. And here you can see we stay on the green line until a critical value when we leave the, uh, the green line. And that is the point when the catalysis is no longer 100% efficient for CO, meaning we're also making some hydrogen, which of course we don't want. And that means we have to stay with our electrolyzer at an operation point, which is at some lambda value above one. In this case, experimentally 1.25. And if lambda is 1.25, a very simple math tells you that the ratio between CO2 and CO, which is flowing out of the electrolyzer, uh, in that case would not be zero, but it would still be one half. That means uh, when you, or as long as you are 100% efficient for CO, you can never uh, exit the electrolyzer with a 100% CO gas stream. There will always be some CO2 mixed together with the CO. This is an important thing you have to keep in mind when you operate uh, these electrolyzer cells. And that means for our second electrolyzer of our tandem scheme, we now have to look not only at the conversion of CO to hydrocarbons, but we have to consider that we're actually entering the second tandem cell uh, with a mix of CO and CO2. And that is shown again here. So we have solved or we have found a suitable catalyst for our first tandem cell, uh, nickel NX sites of nickel NC single site catalysts. We can operate at 100% CO, 
but that does not mean that we're flowing 100% CO out here, but it will be a mixture. And now we have to consider the process of reducing CO plus CO2 mixtures in the second cell. And we do this actually uh, using a technique called electrochemical mass spectrometry or differential mass spectrometry. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this technique because it's quite powerful. It is very sensitive and very selective uh, for electrochemical processes. So a student of mine a few years ago has designed or redesigned uh, a new DEMS based on previous designs, obviously. It looks a bit academic. He's now currently in the process of actually starting a company and uh, revamping and redesigning this uh, into a much more user-friendly way. Um, and his company, by the way, is called Liquid Loop, which is also um, online. And what he did, what the student did, is during his PhD, uh, he not only designed this STEM system, but also a new dual thin layer flow cell that is very similar to uh, designs that have been in the literature before. Uh, he then also designed a new capillary flow cell and a so-called hanging droplet flow cell. I won't have time to discuss the hanging droplet flow cell. If you're interested, uh, check this paper where uh, we have been using uh, this, this flow cell recently. But just to give you the, uh, uh, an idea between the difference of the dual thin layer fuel flow cell and the capillary flow cell, in the dual thin layer cell, you have a thin electrolyte layer at the working electrode. Uh, this is where the reaction actually happens. Uh, you have the products accumulating in the electrolyte. Then you have thin channels that bring those products down to the interface between the liquid electrolyte and the mass spec vacuum. Uh, and every excess is basically then um, flown out here. This is the dual thin layer cell design. Uh, and it's very close to designs that have been in the literature before. The problem of that design is that you cannot reach very large current densities because you run into mass transport problems. Uh, this uh, thin layer uh, is very thin, that's what its name says, and that means there's not much reactant uh, and you run into depletion very easily. Another problem are gas bubbles, which can block uh, these channels and then uh, you have a very inhomogeneous reaction. Now, in order to solve this problem, um, Schorsch, a name of my uh, collaborator, actually raised the working electrode and raised the volume actually of the reacting chamber. Uh, so you have much more liquid. Uh, you don't have to worry about gas bubbles anymore and you're not running into mass transport problems. And the sampling now is done via a capillary, a thin capillary uh, that is uh, sampling electrolyte at the electrode. And then again, you have an extractor um, to the mass spec. And that is then what the capillary cells looks like uh, in the in, uh, real world. Uh, and uh, this, so to speak, can be operated also at much higher current densities and gas bubbles um, are not a problem. Uh, here you can see uh, the gas bubbles, there are gas bubbles. I mean, hydrogen is being made and maybe a gaseous product, uh, but we don't see gas bubbles actually interfering uh, with the sampling of liquid here into the capillary and going into the mass spec. And um, we will use this instrument and this cell now in order to investigate the uh, combined electroreduction of CO and CO2 mixtures. Uh, what we found in a screening cell, not in a mass spec cell, is the following. When you reduce CO2 on copper uh, to ethylene, um, you get a certain Faraday efficiency, which is shown here, uh, or production rate, which is shown here in orange. Um, if you use pure CO, you also uh, get a certain uh, ethylene uh, production rate, which is a little bit less because of the low solubility of CO. Um, now, when you mix the two gases, uh, that was our surprising observation, you actually get more ethylene than in the, in the two pure cases. And uh, that is surprising because when you look at the dissolved um, carbonous species as a function of gas ratios, uh, and this is a logarithmic scale, you can see as soon as you dilute your CO2 with CO, uh, the actual concentration of carbon in the solution drops uh, almost logarithmically, so very quickly, because CO has such a low solubility in liquid. Uh, 
And even though you have so much less carbon in the, in the solution, your ethylene yield or efficiency is actually increasing. That is somewhat um, surprising. So that is something we wanted to investigate further because that could be actually of a much advantage for our uh, second tandem electrolyzer cell. The first thing we did is we made sure that this phenomenon is reproducible also in our uh, mass spectrometer cell. So we applied on a copper electrode, a potential cycle that you can see here. This is roughly from minus 0.2 volts to minus one volt and back. And when we used pure CO feed and we monitored a mass that corresponds to ethylene, you can see the ethylene formation on the anodic and then on the cathodic scan. Then we repeated the experiment in a pure CO2 feed uh, that is given over here. And then you can see the CO2, of course, also formed ethylene at a somewhat uh, larger over potential, but overall the yield was uh, larger. And that has to do with the better solubility of CO2 with CO. But now when we removed this and we actually operated the whole thing under a mix then we saw a dramatic increase in ethylene. So exactly like we uh, saw earlier in the H cell in the more macroscopic cell. So this was the point where we got interested what the mechanistic origin is um, of this behavior. And in order to investigate that, we decided to flow isotopically labeled 13 carbon monoxide together with 12 CO. And in a second step, we also used a CO2 to CO ratio now of one to three uh, in order to enhance the effect of CO. And again, here you can see for a 0.25 bar of CO2, uh, one case with argon balance, one case with CO balance, you can see that you have this ethylene uh, yield in the mass spectrometer and versus under the mixed feed conditions, uh, you essentially uh, have a much larger uh, ethylene yield. Now, when we flew the isotopically labeled CO, uh, we were able uh, by mass to distinguish between ethylene, which was formed by the combination of two carbons coming from the CO2, uh, two carbons coming from CO, and that ethylene, which originated from the combination of a carbon from CO2 and a carbon from CO because these three ethylenes had three different masses. So the ethylene yield coming from the combination of two CO2 molecules is given here in the green scan. Um, and you can integrate and you have an onset potential of minus 0.84 volts for that kind of ethylene. You can now also distinguish the ethylene, which is formed from two 13 CO molecules. You can see here the onset is a bit earlier, um, minus 0.72, and, but the yield is a little bit smaller. The earlier onset can be understood because the kinetics from CO, CO dimerization and ethylene formation is faster than if you start from CO2, which first has to be converted into CO. But finally, the, um, the ethylene, which originates from the combination of a CO coming from CO2 and a CO coming from CO, uh, is here the blue trace uh, that lies in between the onset potentials of the other two and represents the largest sort of ratio of the ethylene, of the total ethylene. We can integrate the charge and we can uh, determine the ratio of each of these reaction pathways. And um, here you show when we add up the three individual pathways, we come back to the original overall uh, cyclic voltammetry. This is just a sort of a mass balance um, check. And over here on the cathodic sweep and the anodic sweep, we can now compare the ethylene, which comes from CO combination, CO2 combination, and uh, from the cross path. And the cross path in the mixed feed, you can see almost half of the ethylene uh, on the anodic sweep comes from this cross coupling between a CO and a CO2. So this cross coupling is very important and helps boost the ethylene yield. Uh, the question is, how is that possible uh, if the two molecules compete for the same size? So in order to understand that better, uh, we also used a, a very simple reaction diffusion models where we uh, modeled the uh, 
diffusion processes of the reactants and the products, as well as the reaction processes on the surface of copper. Uh, these are the entry reaction which we considered. Uh, of course, we have the 12 CO2 to formate, make 12 CO. The 12 CO can form methane. It can also form ethylene. This is this 12 CO uh, coupling pathway. Uh, we also have uh, 13 CO that can make methane. And then we have the cross coupling. This is the blue uh, pathway and we have the coupling of two 13CO molecules. So here you can see these three different types of um, ethylene. And as a competition, of course, we have the hydrogen um, evolution reaction. So we put these uh, reaction diffusion model and we use literature data uh, from Mahori in order to um, determine uh, suitable rate constants, which for most of these reactions are actually not known. We're also considering the bulk reactions uh, between CO2, bicarbonate, and carbonate, uh, similar to earlier models. In order to show you uh, what the model can do, I'll show you here the experimental values published by Hori many years ago for a simple CO2 reduction in bicarbonate on copper. And this is what our model at the current uh, point in time is able to reproduce. What you can see here, it is not able to actually uh, get the, um, the poisoning of CO in the total current. That's what it doesn't catch. But you can see that it qualitatively and almost semi-quantitatively catches the ferritic efficiencies of ethylene, ethane, formate, CO, uh, and the hydrogen uh, character. We were able to nicely reproduce uh, our experiments. You can see here the experimental yields of ethylene as a function of a partial pressure uh, here in the model with the same partial pressure, one bars, uh, we can see qualitatively, see an enhancement in the ethylene formation uh, with or in mixed feeds at one bar. And uh, uh, perhaps even more convincing when you compare the experimental results from our mass back with model, uh, where again, we're sweeping the potential down to about minus 1.1 volts and back up. You can see here the contributions of ethylene from the three different ethylene formation paths. One is the 12-12 coupling, the 13-12 coupling, the cross coupling, and the 13-13 coupling. And our model nicely reproduced the onset potentials. Uh, coupling two CO molecules is easiest. So it occurs first, and then followed by the cross path, and then followed by the coupling of COs resulting from CO2 this little story on CO2 reduction in tandem cells. Um, I told you that uh, we can split the overall CO2 process in two steps. And these two steps can be uh, realized on a molecular scale on tandem electrocatalysts. Uh, but we did not have time to discuss this in detail. But what we had time to discuss is to reduce CO2 stepwise into different subsequent cells, in sequential cells. And for the first cell from CO2 to CO, we recommend the use of nickel NC catalysts, which are actually competitive, if not exceeding the activity of commercial silver catalysts. Um, however, due to the constraints related to the lambda, that is a, an operating parameter for an electrolyzer cell, uh, what comes out of our 100% efficient first tandem cell is not pure CO, but it's always a mixture between CO2 and CO. And that is why in the second tandem cell, where we go to beyond CO products, we have to consider the reduction of mixed feeds. And that's why studying mixed feeds is so important. And we did that using mass spectrometry. Um, I showed you what happens when you mix uh, feeds, where you get an enhanced ethylene yield. And the reason for that is the uh, cross coupling between CO and CO2. And a critical assumption here is that each of these two molecules have uh, their own adsorption sites, which should be in molecular uh, proximity uh, in order for this cross coupling then to occur. And with this, let me thank my collaborators and the funding. 
uh, a longtime collaborator, uh, Professor Jan Rosmeisel and Alexander Bagger, his postdoc. Um, currently on CO2, Brian Seger, Karen Chan, and people at DTU. I'm very grateful for spectroscopic collaborations with Beatrice Roldan and Yanis Timoshenko from the Fritz Haber Institute. And uh, for, uh, for microscopy, uh, I'm, I'm thankful to Mark Hagen uh, and collaborators. Uh, we also had a lot of um, theoretical help in the past by um, Jeff Greeley and his group, and uh, further support by the synchrotron in Grenoble of Dr. Uh, uh, Drinek. Uh, Funding-wise, I would like to thank the German National Science Foundation and our Federal Ministry of uh, Education and Research for continued funding in the areas of um, CO2. And finally, I uh, mentioned the EU Horizon 2020 project, Select CO2 uh, and Ecofuels. With this, I would like to thank the people who actually did the work, amazing people uh, uh, in our group over the years, the people who have been uh, particularly involved in the, in the results I presented today uh, were Nate uh, Leonard, uh, Wen Yu, Xing Li Wang, uh, Sven Brückner, uh, and uh, the people in red are my CO2 team, uh, but I'm thankful to every one of the group uh, because they're really talented people and um, all the papers and all the good results that come out are uh, due to and uh, thanks to their hard work. With this, uh, I'll thank you for your um, attention, for the time, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Professor Stresser. This is a very, very excellent, excellent talk. Uh, we actually got some questions from the chat. Uh, Q and A panel. Taj asked it in person, or you want me to read it? Can you, can you speak? Yeah, I can perhaps oh. ask that question. Perfect. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Taj. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Professor Strasser. Excellent work. But one question is with uh, modeling these uh, um, single side catalysts, speaking from a person who does TFT calculations, it, most pyrolysis approaches synthetically create a diversity of defects on the carbon supports. So how important is it to ensemble average across these diversity of defects instead of considering these MN4 kind of sites which are commonly used? Thank you for this question. Uh, this is actually very important. And uh, I agree that what I presented is a um, sharp simplification because we only considered a motive that involves, for example, four nitrogens uh, that coordinating the metal central side, right? Now, um, certainly in this, or one of the big weaknesses of the synthesis is really the uh, statistical distribution of all kinds of sites uh, and geometries. So we also expect, um, I would say it's a bit hard. Well, but X-ray absorption, I think I've seen papers where people were able to show that you have a distribution of single, double, triple, but also these quadruple coordinated uh, metals. So in reality, uh, DFT calculations should also include um, all four of them. Um, in a um, upcoming paper, uh, just accepted with Karen Chan, actually, she is considering all four uh, coordination motives uh, for these metals. And she also lays out very nicely um, how the different motives uh, affect the actual binding energy of um, carbon-based uh, intermediates uh, and hydrogen. So I, I fully agree with you. Only assuming only or focusing only on one motive is not enough. There are many more. Uh, it's basically up to your computer time, perhaps, uh, that decides how many of these motives you will be able to fully computationally, uh, uh, you know, handle and cover. Um, we believe that probably one of those four uh, are, are most uh, active. And as you know, in Calus, uh, if, if one side uh, is, I don't know, uh, 100 times more of those are dominating the entire um, activity. So even though, yes, we, we should consider all of them, uh, we also know that probably only a very small selection of those different possible motives are controlling the overall reactivity. Uh, because, because in catalysis, it's always a very small selected uh, uh, population of sites which are 
so much more active than the others that they control uh, the, the um, macroscopic reactivity. Um, all the details about the DFT process itself, I have to defer to, to Jan and my collaborators because we're not doing those uh, uh, calculations. I hope I could answer, uh, could answer some of your concerns. Yes, thank you so Good. much. I look forward to the paper by Karen mm -hmm. Chan. Good, thank you, Tash. I think Yang Wei and another uh, audience follow, uh, second that question. Uh, are you all happy about the answer or you want to follow up? Oh, Ho Chen, you, uh, you have a question or? Uh, Professor, I want to ask a different question. Uh, so in your, in your plot of the semen factory, I see that you convert CO2 to CO, then feed that to the fischer tropsch process. So how does your tendon process compare to that uh, conventional thermocatalysis process in terms of economic uh, point of view? From the economic point of view, it can be competing uh, thoroughly with the switch tropsch already? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Thank you for that. Um, now, the fischer tropsch as you know, results in very uh, long carbon chain uh, products, as to say C6 to C6. These are real fuels, like gasoline or, or diesel fuels. Uh, now, those kind of molecules we never obtain uh, in our electrochemical experiments to date. So we're looking at maximum C3 or C4 uh, right now uh, in these tandem type uh, schemes. Um, so that's the first big, big difference yeah, between the classical fischer tropsch and uh, what, I, what I've uh, presented uh, today. And, and so it's hard to say which one is better uh, because they're, they're making completely different products, right? Uh, however, and uh, this is where this uh, EU, EU project between our group uh, and a uh, couple of European partners and Siemens Energy comes in. Uh, it's called EcoFuel. And in this, uh, in this project, we pursue a sort of a modified fischer tropsch where we first go electrochemically from C to ethylene and propylene. And then we have a gas phase uh, process or step where we turn ethylene and propylene mixtures directly into liquid hydrocarbons, C6 to, C6 to C12, say. So that is the uh, competing process. We need to compare to the classic fischer tropsch uh, where you come from uh, you know, electrochemically just to hydrogen, and then you mix your CO2 in the gas phase, and then you do gas phase um, catalysis. And in this uh, project, uh, we claim, uh, I mean, this was our hypothesis, we claim that this modified, so to speak, uh, fischer tropsch where the electrochemistry is not only going up to hydrogen, but it's going actually to ethylene propylene, uh, can have efficiency advantages. Because that conversion from ethylene propylene to liquid fuels is easier than going uh, from hydrogen uh, CO mixtures to C6 or C12 fuels. Um, we have first evidence for this. We're, this project just started earlier this year. And that is actually the process we should compare to the fischer tropsch right? The electrochemistry itself will uh, most likely never go to C6, to C6 or C, uh, C12. Uh, that is for some reason not possible. I mean, maybe, maybe in the future someone comes up with that, but right now I don't see that. Yeah. But the, but there's a possibility to go with electrochemistry at least to C2 and C3 gaseous uh, hydrocarbon products and then use gas phase catalysis to go that second step um, to C6 to C12. Awesome. Thank you. I, I, since we are here, uh, I just want to follow up on that uh, note. Uh, fischer chop is somehow struggling from stopping the, the polymerization of the carbon. They, get a lot of wax and then they crack it. So maybe that's something they, you know, first of all, we need to understand why electrocatalysis cannot go beyond C2 or C3. So those things, the, the most likely the reaction environment, uh, those things maybe can be learned and understand so we can help the heterogeneous or his, uh, fischer chop catalysis to help them to stop at the C, maybe C6 or C8 or C10, it would be amazing. So I want to have your comment on this. Uh, is it possible or 
it's just too too difficult to understand. Ooh, I can just speculate. Uh, really, I uh, ultimate uh, the molecular reason why we can go higher is uh, I think no one knows that. I would say it's uh, the presence of a of an electrolyte, yeah, the liquid electrolyte uh, makes a big difference between the two. Uh, concepts or catalytic processes uh, as a whole. Um, so the, the electrolyte is constantly also interacting with your intermediates. And um, I believe um, the, the electrolyte uh, sort of has a dilution effect. Uh, it has uh, yeah, a Coulomb interaction, all kinds of interaction with your intermediates. And, and I think this may be one of the reasons why uh, yeah, C3 uh, C3 is currently the highest hydrocarbon uh, that we have observed uh, in the electrochemical process, because at that point, maybe the interaction with the solvent uh, becomes, uh, yeah, becomes so strong that the solvent is uh, making it energetically favorable for this uh, fragment basically to desorb rather than to add more and more uh, fragments onto it. Um, also, you must, I mean, we still speak of two processes. One is at room temperature, uh, and the other one is at uh, 200 or 300 degrees C, right? Uh, we, we're talking about different partial pressures uh, of the reactants. Uh, this also is a huge difference, uh, which may have to do, or which may affect uh, that we're not seeing more than, than C3 uh, in the electrochemical process. Good, thank you, that's very helpful. I think Dr. Long Yanwei has a question. Uh, Yanwei is an expert on CO2 uh, electrocatalysis as well. Uh, Yanwei, do you want to speak in out. Can you, uh, are you able to unmute yourself or? Oh, cannot. Let me see. Yeah, yeah, we have to allow. Okay, uh, hi, I, I think I can speak now. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Strasser, for the very excellent talk. I have a question about the co-feeding of CO2 and CO. Uh, how do you come up with the hypothesis that there are kind of two sites where one uh, preferentially absorb CO2 and one the other one that uh, only preferentially absorbs CO. I, I, I think that was a really, really good hypothesis. But why, why do you think this happens? And secondly, do you think it also happens for, I, I know the studies are focused on ethylene, but do you think it also happens on the different products like maybe ethanol uh, or even like C3 products like propanol? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Uh that this may have also have an effect on these uh, uh, higher or oxygenate products. We have not studied that uh, in particular. Uh, we actually uh, are going back to our mass spec data uh, and, and see whether we see that effect also. Um, but well, how did I come to this hypothesis? Just by, by when you think of you have, if you have only one type of site, yeah, or if you assume you just have one type of site uh, and now you're mixing uh, you're, you're mixing CO2 with, with CO, and thereby you you're drastically reduce the amount of carbon in your electrolyte. Uh, to me, at least, it is not, uh, it's not clear. Uh, it, it's not, uh, I would not be able to rationalize why you would all of a sudden see enhanced formation of um, ethylene products or of CO-CO coupling products. If you drastically reduce um, the... Uh, the total amount of carbon uh, at the interface. And uh, because you're, you're introducing a competition then, right, of CO and CO2, you're reducing the amount of carbon species, you introduce a competition. Um, and that um, to me intuitively, um, I did not make sense that this uh, enhances the ethylene yield. And in our model, actually, that's what we found also when we remove this uh, assumption uh, that you have two different sites, uh, then we don't see an enhancement uh, of the ethylene. And um, obviously it makes sense. We, we have very many different types of sites on such a copper polysurface. And so I don't see a reason why CO should not prefer a slightly different uh, surface site than a CO2 molecule. Uh, we know, for example, CO2 reacts very sensitively uh, to electric fields. And uh, depending on the detailed molecular morphology of such a copper surface, the electric field locally may be very different from site to site. And the ones with a larger uh, electric field perhaps are more uh, um, amenable or accessible or uh, interact stronger with the CO2 molecule. 
versus other sites may interact stronger with a CO molecule. So all in all, actually, from a chemical uh, uh, intuition point of view, it makes all sense to me. Yeah, thank you. That, that's very, very interesting. And you said they have to be in like molecular proximity, so like uh, on the angstrom or nanometer scale, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, the dimerization, this would be my uh, modest chemical intuition. The dimerization happens on the surface. You have two adsorbed molecules nearby, and then you have the uh, formation of a COCO dimer. Uh, that is our common model right now. And of, obviously, that requires uh, for the two CO fragments to be in a molecular distance or proximity. So, and uh, I'm, I'm sure these, I mean, it doesn't have to be very, very just one site next to the other one. It could be small domains of one type of site. Uh, you can think of facets or steps, you know, and then they have this uh, interface boundary. Uh, and then there is where this uh, uh, CO, CO dimer formation or coupling uh, would occur uh, and on one domain or on one facet uh, or step you have pre preferentially adsorption of CO2 and on the other one you have preferential adsorption um, of CO. That's sort of my very simple chemical um, idea right now. Thank you, right. thank you. I think this is very exciting research. Good, thank you. Um, Hujia, I saw you have another question, but before yeah, that, sorry, I, 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 we don't have enough questions from the audience, so I turned up asking all the questions. Right, uh, I just want I to know our, our material science students are quite shy today. I just want to ask a material science question to you, mm -hmm. Professor, uh, because in your in this in this talk, your catalyst is pretty much settled, right? You show that your nickel NC catalyst, and uh, then you use the copper as the other end, as the other side of the tandem reaction. Uh, just wondering for a young material science students entering this field, uh, where, what, what would you advise to be uh, to best putting their effort on? Or in other words, where do you see a, uh, a needs a material, materials innovation? <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, you have to understand between sort of uh, maybe discovering uh, the new record, uh, record active catalyst and understanding sort of uh, uh, things. Uh, one thing that I'm, I, I find still, uh, uh, yeah, um, insufficiently understood is the, the thing that we said at the beginning, that these type of single site catalysts are typically formed in this high temperature process. And um, I'm sort of, I think we're in need of a, of a material scientist that can design these uh, nickel nitrogen coordinated sites in a very controlled way. Uh, maybe not through a pyrolysis process. So implanting uh, nickel atoms uh, very controlled in a defined, um, highly oriented uh, carbon uh, surface, say, uh, which was doped with nitrogen. I'm sure there are attempts out there, but I haven't seen anything that convinced me completely. Uh, in order to study the reactivity of such a single site, uh, you know, in a very controlled environment where you know uh, the, the material all has the same uh, sort of molecular structure. So almost like a, a, like a molecular uh, study, right? In a molecule, in a porphyrin or in a phthalocyanine, uh, we know that uh, every molecule looks the same, has the same chemical structure, uh, but basically the uh, solid state analog uh, of, such a, of such a molecule. If a material scientist could actually find a way to prepare uh, such a well-defined, uh, yeah, ideally, of course, uh, single crystal or highly oriented uh, uh, carbon surface, dope it with nitrogen and put metal into it, uh, such that we can actually perform the catalytic studies of these single sites in a much more controlled, isolated way than it's possible now. So I would say this is a, a, an interesting and very challenging uh, project for a young material scientist on the fundamental understanding kind of view. And uh, for the discovery, of course, of new record uh, performing ones, um, yeah, the sky is the limit, right? In these uh, materials concepts, you can also think of uh, several metal uh, ions that interact. Many papers already um, have appeared on, on this topic. Uh, what happens if we bring two of those metals in an in a atomic proximity? Uh, again, the problem is the control of such a synthesis process. Uh, maybe uh, a smart materials chemist or material scientist 
uh, could find a way uh, to make that happen, you know, to have two of those single site catalysts, but in a controlled way. Yeah. Uh, what we have now is always the statistics. Uh, and that's a bit, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's unfortunate yeah, that we haven't made progress uh, uh, in that. What, what we, we have collaborated with organic chemists that have made these covalently uh, uh, organic frameworks. And there, you know exactly where the nitrogens are and the nickel, but these materials have no conductivity. And uh, the catalytic activity, at least in our laboratories, were close to zero for CO2 reduction of those very defined uh, organic, covalently uh, organic frameworks. So we need something, I mean, we, we need to start with sort of a perfidic surface, but implant dope, uh, I don't know, controlled prepare these nitrogen uh, metal sites, these single sites, and then study the reactivity. Uh, I would say these, these are possible uh, directions for young material scientists. Thank you very much. Mm. Good. Thanks. Uh, I have a couple of questions as well, but before that, is there any questions from our students, postdocs? It's a good opportunity. You can write in the chat if you want. All right, I'll, I'll just, um, uh, for, for just following the materials design, uh, Professor Stresser, I fully agree with you. Uh, we need to have a much better control on the synthesis of our, our material. Uh, but on the other hand, the catalysis is always dynamic. Uh, and especially under the electrocatalysis, the conditions are quite harsh, I guess. So what, what is your comment on that? Um, you know, the emerging technologies like the operando uh, uh, surface sensitive technologies, uh, you know, we need to identify the active sites under the, uh, you know, uh, cat catalytic condition. So uh, what do you think? Uh, are those uh, really challenging work or those are people uh, uh, pay attention to or just general thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, this is a very important development. Uh, we all, I mean, operando uh, is a concept used by almost everyone these days. Mm. Uh, operando is important because the catalyst, as you said, changes uh, mm -hmm. under reaction conditions. Uh, in case of these single site molecules, for example, it would be interesting to know uh, what the metal center really does uh, during the catalysis and how its redox state affects the products. Um, I showed you this very simple uh, initial results where we saw that when iron uh, changes its oxidation state, we saw that uh, there is a correlation with, the, um, with more and more hydrocarbon formation. Uh, this is not a proof that there is a, a causation or a cause behind it. Uh, but these are the kind of studies, of course, that need to be extended. Uh, what's the nickel doing? Uh, we, I have seen studies where people really prove that nickel turns also in nickel one. Uh, in some of those, uh, any nickel NC materials, even in the dry state, uh, we saw a nickel one state, uh, which obviously then would also be dynamically changed um, under the CO2 reduction um, catalysis. So um, a better structure or a chemical state versus reactivity relation of those single site catalysts um, is desirable and that can only be obtained uh, with these um, operando studies. And that can be, uh, most people, when they hear operando, they always think about x-rays. Uh, that is very important, but there's many more. Uh, there's also like Raman or um, uh, in our case, for example, this kind of mass spectrometry, I think is very important. Mm -hmm. Typically we don't refer to that as an operando a method because it's always dynamic and in line, right? Mm -hmm. um, but let's just say a kind of a real-time mass spectrometry uh, is very important because that allows you uh, really conclusions to the mechanistic steps and the sequence of the mechanistic steps uh, and the onset potential, meaning the first time when you see an intermediate uh, that tells you or the sequence between these onset potentials uh, tell you uh, sort of the um, sort of a, a rough uh, sequence also of the elementary of the elementary reactions. And I'm, I'm also convinced that, uh, for example, with mass spectrometry, onset potentials of intermediates uh, can be or should be correlated to DFT 
uh, uh, parameters or DFT results uh, can be thermodynamic limiting potentials or maybe even a kinetic type of limiting potential. Uh, and so we get a direct correlation between mass spec results and DFT. Uh, uh, that, that's where, that are what I would like to see in the future. And we're actively working um, on this. So extracting from onset potentials, mechanistic information. Uh, so there's, there's a wide variety of operando or inline or real-time techniques. Also microscopy, obviously, uh, in situ liquids. Uh, we have such a holder, but it's very challenging uh, for those very small structures. Because liquid in situ, TEM stem works the best, you know, for things which are like say 20 nanometers or even larger. The larger the, let's say, easier to image. Uh, this is our experience. Right, our parental is one uh, one hand, but also surface sensitive, I think, has uh, is also very important. This erection only occurs on the top layer, hopefully, uh, of the catalyst. So what do you think, um, the current technologies, are they capable of uh, really revealing the, the, the active site activity, or, you know, pathways and so on? And what are the, uh, the things we need to do for example, really use high energy uh, lasers like free electron lasers and so on. Sorry, it's a little late. Um, how about after this, if we don't have further questions? <laughs> yep, thanks. Oh, oh, Andrew has a, has a question. Mm. Uh, yes, I, I guess uh, while we're waiting to see if any other uh, questions pop in uh, before we conclude, I, I do want to ask, um, just about uh, your general perspective, you know, I I really feel that um, for um, CO2 electrochemistry, one thing that uh, we are looking for uh, is how to achieve higher activity. Uh, and certainly, there's a lot we can do in terms of uh, selectivity. There's a lot we can do in terms of a smart cell design to try to push the current density higher and other schemes uh, such as uh, being able to break the reaction into steps and then assemble them into some tandem process. But I'm just curious, you know, how much uh, hope or how much optimism you have about actually finding the more inherently active material uh, for some of these steps. Uh, and um, also, you know, whether you believe that some strategies may or may not be promising uh, to this end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, this is a question for the crystal ball, right? Mm -hmm. Mine actually, unfortunately, stopped working last night, so I um, can't tell you exactly what's going to happen. Um, I'm confident uh, that we will make progress uh, on the Faraday efficiency side as number one. Um, some people claim efficiency um, may be even more important uh, than the activity. Uh, with activity, I assume you mean overpotential, right? Uh, because uh -huh. you, if you solve the, the Faraday efficiency first, uh, you may solve uh, cost problems with uh, product separation later on. Uh, and then basically you have still have a limited energy efficiency, but a good Faraday efficiency, or you could say chemical selectivity. Uh, and that make this process basically being pushed in a sort of a, a commercially viable zone, right? Um, I'm, however, when I think of a tandem scheme, if I think that you locally, spatially separate certain uh, elementary steps, or at least groups of elementary steps, that you may be able to solve um, both challenges, perhaps together. Uh, so Faraday efficiency plus uh, over potential. And that is because uh, if you uh, spatially separate uh, groups or individual elementary steps, you are able to operate those uh, individual uh, portions of the overall mechanism at very different conditions, right? Uh, so as I said at the beginning, uh, perhaps closer to their actual native um, over potential or, or reversible potential. Whereas if you try to do everything in one reactor on one catalyst under one set of conditions, one solvent, uh, one counter ion or so, uh, one of those steps requires certain, you know, given over potentials and all the other steps have no choice and are sort of subject to that same over potential inefficiency. So uh, separating steps spatially 
uh, I believe, offers the potential to solve both efficiency um, and activity, meaning over potential. All right, very good, thank you. I think it's you. quite overdue. Uh, if, uh, if it's okay, Ho Chen. Yeah, I think we should also, probably call it. Yeah. Thanks, Professor Stresser, for thank uh, you having me. Yeah. Yes. Such a wonderful seminar, thank you.